Hello everyone, this is an American Thinks, uh, here to discuss Star Lady by George R. R. Martin for the Thousand Worlds Book Club being run by Preston Jacobs. Uh, now, I started off with this story actually listening to Preston's narration, uh, which I, uh, I personally thought was very good, and especially in doing my own videos and uh, coming up with scripts and trying to narrate them um, and seeing how much work it is. Um, I thought it, uh, what he did, what Preston did, was a very good job uh, as far as narrating the story, in particular because there's so much slang um, throughout the story, um, which I can only imagine would make it hard to narrate. Um, I, uh, because for me, it, it uh, was very difficult to listen to, and not because Preston did a bad job, but because it's very, uh, it's, it's very awkward uh, trying to follow the story with so much slang in there. Uh, so I eventually switched over to the print edition, which made it a little better because, you know, I could back up and, you know, read through something again and sort of uh, take the idioms in context and kind of work out what they meant. Um, you know, incidentally, all the creative writing advice that I've ever gotten uh, says don't rely on your own created slang uh, for your stories, uh, probably for uh, this very reason. But actually in... Um, in an interesting way, I, th I think in this case, in the case of Star Lady, it actually works. Uh, because it does give you an awkward and somewhat confused feeling, uh, which I imagine is somewhat like uh, what Star Lady must feel trying to figure out this new place that she's in. Uh, so it kind of helps you empathize with her character. So I think in this sense it works, although it was uh, definitely some work trying to get through the story. Um, and this is uh, another point I should bring out here as far as the construction of the story is concerned. It, it also feels awkward to me because I couldn't really identify a true protagonist. Um, Star Lady is, of course, the titular character and she plays the most prominent role at the end. Uh, but the story opens from Hal's perspective. Uh, so generally your tendency is to want to identify uh, with Hal at the beginning. And, um, you know, throughout most of the story, it's sort of told from this disembodied uh, third-person perspective. Um, so it is kind of hard to identify with any particular character. Um, as far as story analysis, Preston mentions similarities in theme uh, between Star Lady and the Arya Stark storyline, uh, which I honestly didn't get that impression upon my reading, but I am glad that he mentioned it because, um, you know, he presents a lot of good points. And... Um, the you know obviously the story does share a lot of uh, similar themes and it has the uh, the fish out of water feel uh, to what Arya uh, is feeling in the, her story in Bravo so I do sort of get that um, and it's not like I uh, necessarily disagree but when I read Star Lady I got much more of an impression of the Jamie Brienne story where obviously uh, Jamie is golden boy. Um, because, you know, both Jamie and Golden Boy are locked away, uh, they're both being kept for political gain, um, both appear to be in something of a handicapped state, um, and both are attacked, um, and then both Star Lady and Brienne inexplicably form feelings for their Golden Boys. Um, I think in both cases I, I feel uh, justified in saying that, because they don't quite make sense. I, uh, probably more so in Star Lady, uh, because you don't really see them any other than sleeping together. Um, I mean, literally sleeping together, resting together. Star Lady and Golden Boy don't really seem to do much of anything together. It's sort of hard to see how they form a bond. Whereas Brienne and Jamie, I guess you could say, you know, they go through so much together um, that they've, uh, you know, formed a personal connection. I guess I could see that one a little bit more, but I think in both cases the, uh, emotional feelings are, uh, are, uh, certainly unusual. I, I guess we could at least say that and feel comfortable. Um, and then Star Lady and Brienne also both fight for their men, although in the end, uh, both Jamie and Golden Boy appear to rescue the women in the stories, although, uh, and, and both in the middle of a duel, actually. Um, I would say probably in the case of Star Lady, the rescue appears to be far more subtle. It's not you know, as overt as uh, what Jamie does with Brienne, but it does appear that Golden Boy is uh, subtly working behind the scenes somehow to uh, um, work in Star Lady's favor. 
Um, that's as far as, you know, the plot itself, the uh, similarities that I see, similarities in theme. Um, other similarities that aren't necessarily related to plot, but since we're considering this in the context of A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, I've got two more points to make here. First is themes in sexuality. Uh, and George R. R. Martin has um, recurring themes of sexuality in very many of his works, including A Song of Ice and Fire, um, including sexual fetishes for other species. And, of course, this depends on what your definition of uh, species is, but essentially what I'm trying to say is uh, George R. R. Martin has people in his stories that say, hey, this thing looks different from me. I wonder if I can fuck it. And this doesn't appear, uh, you know, at first blush, this doesn't appear to be a, a very strongly featured in A Song of Ice and Fire until you consider the likelihood that the first men were interbreeding with the children. And that legends uh, also say the first men and the others were interbreeding. And I, of course, mentioned both of these in my theory video on the others. And uh, this is just uh, one more example of this uh, recurring theme with uh, George R. R. Martin, which I, I feel um, you know, provides some uh, support uh, for both of these being true in The Song of Ice and Fire. Um, George R. R. Martin also has recurring themes of genetic manipulation. And I believe that I've mentioned this before as well, but to me it smacks very strongly of the dragons in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, we, in our world, we tend to idealize megafauna, especially uh, carnivorous uh, megafauna, because they're visually striking and thinking of them in a kinetic sense and, you know, their power and uh, prowess and so forth. Um, you know, to us they're very appealing, but in survival terms, being a huge carnivore is actually extremely difficult because you burn so many calories uh, to support your, you know, the sheer mass of, uh, of your body and, and metabolism. Um, so just about all of your time is spent just trying to get food, and in particular food that is trying to get away from you. And if you start running into a calorie deficit, uh, the effects can spiral out of control and become severe uh, very quickly because you're just burning through so many calories. Um, and uh, typically, um, carnivorous megafauna also tend to have uh, high infant mortality rates uh, for these reasons. Uh, you know, the, uh, the juvenile uh, carnivores um, you know, don't have the uh, capacity to withstand caloric deficit in the same way that adults can. And so it's, uh, you know, they tend to die quickly and it's one more hurdle that they get, have to get over in order to survive as a species. Uh, so in this context, there is literally no evolutionary advantage for dragons to evolve with their incubation being dependent on the presence of humans. And not just any humans, but a specific type of humans, in this case Valerians. Um, and I would argue that this characteristics of dragons very strongly implies that genetic manipulation by the Valerians uh, is at play and not just natural evolution. Uh, most likely, I, I would theorize, most likely with the goal of prohibiting dragon proliferation to other cultures. You know, the Valerians had this uh, massive military advantage in having these dragons and they didn't want others to acquire that advantage. Um, in any case, uh, that's what I found, uh, was able to glean from Star Lady. If you found other things, certainly uh, feel free to leave your comments um, below. And uh, stay tuned uh, for a new theory video I have coming up on the Horn of Joraman, which actually is going to talk about this um, aspect of uh, megafauna and species survival. Um, it may not make sense to you at first, but I promise when we get there, it's going to be interesting. So stay tuned for that. Thank you guys for watching. Take care. Bye.